What is the common image we see when you hear the word prostitute, hooker, harlot, lady of the night? For decades, the portrayal of sex workers in America has been fairly consistent. They're all bone-thin crackheads selling their bodies to support their habits. They're a strain on society because instead of going out and learning a trade, they're just whoring themselves out. They're easy to dehumanize. When they're brutalized, beaten, or just disappear, it often goes unnoticed. In relation to serial killers who have targeted sex workers, these ladies who work the streets have been described in terms such as the lesser dead. But these are humans, working just like everyone else. People can hate on sex workers all they want, but oftentimes, those who hate them are still stuck in that stereotypical perspective presented about who these people are. It's a perspective that's lazy and ignores many things, such as the varying levels of financial success that sex workers have attained, putting some responsibility on the Johns who pursue their services, socioeconomic factors, and the varying backgrounds and upbringings of those who specifically go into sex work. And believe it or not, there was a time when working in that field as a profession was not quite so taboo. Every city, town, and even small community at some level had a history with this. And every history in this regard is unique, but with some correlations. In regards to this particular video, I will be focusing exclusively on my hometown's history tied to sex work, specifically the history of brothels in the city of Portland, Oregon. While there was always some blowback against houses of prostitution, often driven by local churches, during the latter 1800s the notion of such places fit in perfectly with the City of Roses as it was during that time. A city full of drunks and transients, businesses storing their trash in their basements, a saloon every 10 feet, and vice in all of its forms often taking place with limited legal opposition. Many people in those days would call brothels the worst form of vice that a city had to offer, and yet, as many historians will acknowledge, this history is obscure in many ways, and incomplete. In this piece, I combined as many resources as possible to tell not just this history, the best I can, about Portland's brothels, but also the actions that led to these arguably classy joints being replaced by rundown joints on Skid Row. For the most part, then, this history will be restricted to the years 1870 to 1910. This period of history will also be covered primarily in chronological order, just to make things easier on me. There were certainly brothels in Portland pre-1870, but the available information on them is just a nudge above nothing. And certainly there were a handful of brothels in existence post-1910, but by 1910 they were dying at a rapid rate. Most old articles about brothels after this time referenced brothels in other places or were referencing brothels during a time prior to that. The oldest article I was able to find referencing a brothel specifically in Portland came from a June 23rd, 1863 article from the Morning Oregonian. It merely referenced a shooting that happened at one, with no further context. Simply defined, the Oxford Dictionary describes a brothel as a house where men can visit prostitutes. They were also known under many other names, such as banyos, bordellos, houses of prostitution, houses of ill fame, houses of ill repute, body houses, whorehouses, parlor houses, cat houses, 
disorderly houses, creep joints, and even cribs. However, unlike brothels which had multiple sex workers, cribs were often small cottage-like homes resided in by one working woman. There was just enough room inside for a bed and a few other items. Closer to the turn of the century, the term crib would more often be used in association with brothels. In the case of both, standard practice was for the working girl to linger in the house's window, or even in the doorway, flaunting themselves and showing passing men clearly what they were there for. The existence of brothels dates back to the BC era, existing in places such as ancient Greece and China. They began popping up with frequency in America during the 19th century, with over 200 existing in Lower Manhattan all by itself. As was the case in Portland, brothels were illegal all over the country, but seldom was the law enforced against them by police or local governments, as oftentimes they were benefiting from their existence. And when one thinks about the world of brothels, they think about New York, Washington, D.C., small Wild West towns, and, of course, New Orleans. But not really places like Portland, Oregon. Probably, at least in part because of this, there is practically no visual record of this history in Portland. So I'm just going to have to do the best I can with that. Portland was not only a dirty town throughout the 1800s, but it was a town where men staunchly outnumbered the women. This left few women for men to pursue, get into relationships with, or even marry, and likely left many men sexually unsatisfied. And for that ailment, these women could provide a perfect medication. It's no surprise that brothels found great success in this city despite ongoing pressure against them from Portland's churches. While Portland's origins go back to the 1840s, its sex worker history prior to the 1860s is practically unknown. There can be little doubt that even as the city had less than 3,000 residents going into the 1860s, that there were at least a few houses of ill repute in town. Even in Portland's Chinese community, wherein even by 1870 there were reportedly less than 50 women, they had houses of prostitution. In fact, most Chinese women who came to Portland in those early years worked in brothels in the city's original Chinatown, down along the waterfront. Their clients were mainly male immigrants, passing through town on their way to rural sites where they could find work in fields such as mining or railroad construction. While there were considerably more white-run brothels in the city, these Chinese brothels got about equal attention in local news, if nothing more than to push ongoing racial hatred towards Portland's Chinese residents. And if these stories weren't being critical, they were simply making fun. A small article from 1867 tells the story of a Chinese brothel wherein local white people heard the noises of what went on inside and gathered around it only for a woman to run out and scream for them to leave and to respect her privacy, which was greeted with jeers from passing whites. Many of these Chinese houses were located between Southwest 3rd Avenue and the Willamette River up into the 1890s. The white-run cribs and brothels, wherein many of the girls were either French or Jewish, were mainly along 3rd and 4th Avenue, practically across the street. In a space known as the Tenderloin District, or the Red Light District, which ran between 3rd and 4th Avenue and then Yamhill and Taylor Streets, the stretch along 3rd Avenue was perhaps the city's most notorious, considering who'd presided there. While information, even from the 1870s, is sparse, one editorial from April 1868 noted, perhaps hyperbolically, that there was a brothel for every six houses that stood in town. Brothels from these early years were likely modest in appearance, as 
most buildings were at that time, with the visual charm being strictly what was going on inside of them. If there was any reoccurring drama related to brothels in those early years, the most common form was the fact that many girls working in these places were very young, sometimes preteens, a sad fact of brothels all over the country. Once again, Chinese brothels received more criticism in this regard, but it happened everywhere. According to the 1880 census, wherein many women marked their occupation as prostitute, showing how much less taboo it once was, most girls in brothels were 19 years old or older. Granted, considering the fact that many of these women seldom used their real names, some of them likely lied about their ages as well. But Molly Moss of the infamous Carrie Bradley's brothel was listed in the census as being 15 years old. This made sense for Carrie Bradley, who, trust me, we will be talking about later. She didn't play by the rules. And sometimes, again if you go by the census, the youngest person living there were domestics, who often worked as servants there. These people were also often Chinese males. For instance, an Ah Ki, 16 years old, was listed as a domestic at a Yamhill Street brothel. While often listed again as domestics, if these individuals were living in a house of prostitution, they most likely served other purposes, including providing extra muscle in case any customers got a little rough. Many brothels also had people that they sent to scope out local train stations, hoping to find young, unattended women. These women would often be promised a place to live at a boarding house in exchange for the services they would need to provide. A very telling story in terms of the psychology of 150 years ago appeared in the Morning Oregonian in March 1871. In it, a girl of about 13 was reportedly saved from the brothel she frequented many, many times, only for her to run away and return there. Her attitude was that her actions and where she chose to be was nobody's business but her own. In response to this, she was taken before a judge who abruptly deemed her insane, and she was sent away to an asylum. This showed the desperate measures that would be taken to save the young from a life of depravity. Come March 1871, City Ordinance Number 959 was established, presenting an early example of the attitude that would ultimately win the day. If prostitution could not be removed from Portland altogether, the next best thing was to at least put it somewhere where the locals didn't have to see it. Ordinance 959 made it unlawful to have brothels within the city limits with a punishment of up to $100 and up to 20 days in jail. As would become commonplace, this ordinance was only passively enforced, with the number of brothels in the city only growing after its implementation. A small fine was never going to be enough to run a successful house out of town. This ordinance was also put into effect while the chief of police was a man named James LaPayas. After serving previously as the town's marshal, he was inserted as the chief of police in 1870. James LaPayas also ran his own saloon, known for gambling, and gambling halls and prostitution oftentimes went hand in hand. He was known to associate with brothel madams like Carrie Bradley, and rumor had it, his corruption went all the way back to the end of the 1850s. In what would result in Portland's first public execution, a man named Danford Balch snapped when his daughter ran off to marry a man named Mortimer Stump. After several days of drinking, Balch met up with his daughter and Stump by the Stark Street Ferry on November 8, 1858, and executed Stump with a shotgun. As, again, rumor had it, Lapeus, then the marshal, offered to leave the jail door open for Balch if his wife would pay him a $1,000 bribe. 
Apparently, Miss Balch couldn't raise the money, and Danford Balch was hung. That rumor stuck with Lapeus from then on. Simply put, he was hardly a lily white police chief, and he associated with the very kinds of people that the 1871 ordinance was supposed to shut down. And if laws set to deal with certain forms of vice in the city weren't being properly implemented, imagine how wild west the Willamette River had to be. Before all being incorporated into the city of Portland, there were three towns bordering that river, Portland, East Portland, and Albina. Each had their own police force, following different laws, and none of them had explicit control over the land that the river flowed through. Understandably, some brothels existed on boats out on that river. Such brings us to the story of a woman named Nancy Boggs. With the lack of available information in relation to floating brothels, as they were sometimes called, a lot of this history pertains to this one woman. However, Nancy's story is also best known through the account of Edward Spider Johnson, a former North End character who spun past stories to historian Stuart Holbrook. Holbrook is heavily criticized as a reliable source, and yet a lot of old stories of vice that we have come through him and those he spoke to. In the case of Nancy Boggs, Holbrook frequently altered elements of her story, right down to the colors of her floating brothel. Because of this, some believe the whole story of Nancy Boggs' haven on the sea is fiction. Or if she did have such a place, it was not all that charming in appearance. As the story goes, she took advantage of the freedom of the river and cleaned up a 40-foot by 80-foot scow, which was more like a barge. She made it bright and vibrant in appearance. The bottom floor was a combination saloon and dance hall, while the upper floor was where the girls were. To avoid police confrontation, customers would be picked up on the shore via rowboat and transported to Nancy's place. She would float her brothel up and down the river, sometimes going all the way to Oregon City, wherever the action was. And, like others, it's believed that Nancy had police connections. It seemed whenever a raid was planned from one side of the river or the other, she would be set near the opposite shoreline. With perhaps her greatest crime being not paying her taxes on the liquor she served, Police on each side of the river finally managed to play nice with each other and coordinate a raid coming from both ends. Perhaps tipped off by a friend on the police force, Nancy was prepared for the raid. She had a hose attached to the boat's heating plant, allowing for the spray of burning steam down on encroaching officers, leading to their abrupt departure and the abandonment of that raid. It was a truly dramatic event where Madame Boggs came away the winner, initially. Only hours later, in the dead of night, someone cut the anchor free from her vessel, leading to it flowing, unstoppable, to the north. Responding fast, she descended on a rowboat and hurried to the shores of Albina, where she alerted a skipper of her brothel's situation. The skipper got his crew together, and they managed to chase down Nancy's whiskey scow, with the girls still on board. It seemed there was nothing Nancy couldn't take on. But, as the story goes, she did not seem to agree. Shortly after these particular events, she ceased operations on her floating brothel and resumed working on dry land, like most did. This is the legendary story albeit probably not entirely accurate. Her fashionable barge was never mentioned in newspapers when it was in action. A handful of articles referencing her one-time brothel barge did pop up in the 1890s, giving it some credibility beyond the account of Spider Johnson. She was known to run a saloon on Pine Street, near the North End as early as 1877. That same year, she was busted for running a brothel that I can only assume was upstairs from that place or next door. 
She had this saloon, coincidentally, as late as 1882, the same year she supposedly shut down her floating brothel. There's just enough references that it's likely she did have this scow at one time, but it was likely not as flashy as later stories would imply. And, just a little side note, a local musical show called Sex on the River was done in Portland, and it focused on the life of Nancy Boggs, and I noticed one of the actresses playing Nancy herself was a woman named Julianne Nelson, whose name I thought I recognized. Then I remembered she'd acted in a short film I did several years ago. So, there's that. With the dawn of the 1880s, the city of Portland entered into its true heyday in its brothel history. Most of its houses of ill fame were placed in the Tenderloin District, with a few even less savory outliers close by or further north. The vicinity of 3rd Avenue around Taylor and Yam Hill would become a haven for tiny cribs, often housing high-priced French courtesans. Otherwise, 3rd Avenue was lined with bagnos, many of which, considering the common structures of the time, were in simple frame houses. All the charm lingered inside. We can see this through the 1880 census, a critical document to understanding houses of prostitution at that time. Dozens of women listed their profession as prostitution, something you're unlikely to see today. But even with brothels being technically illegal, women were fine identifying with them, even including specific addresses as their places of residence that were connected to such establishments. In this census, we find a few iconic brothels of that time. Referred to by Stuart Holbrook as one of Portland's three sirens of this era, the other two being Nancy Boggs and Elizabeth Young, a.k.a. Liverpool Liz, Mary Cook filled the 1880s with vice all her own. In 1880, she ran a house on the southeast corner of Second and Alder, wherein she had three girls working for her, Fanny Grinnell, Effie Myers, and Dora Thompson. Sure, she probably had more, like the others, but these were the only ones listed in the census. A block away at the southwest corner of 3rd and Alder was Bridget Gallagher's place, where she had five girls that we know of. Lottie Brooks, Fanny Dawson, Florence Taylor, Amy Latin, and Billy Ma. Remember, odds are these were not the actual names of many of these women. A Jenny Savage ran a house on 2nd Avenue between Alder and Morrison, where she had six girls. Dolly Bennett, Ava Burton, Sarah M. Gibbs, Belle Moore, Alice Livingston, and Lizzie Berry. In Jenny's place, we find that, like everything else, Portlanders looked to the largest West Coast city at the time, San Francisco, for guidance. We took our style from San Francisco, we took our architecture from San Francisco, and according to a July 1876 article, we took women from there too. An ironically named John Lawless was arrested at this time for procuring young girls to send up to Portland. One girl he sent went to the police, and he was apprehended. While searching his home, authorities found a letter from Jenny Savage to Lawless, begging him to send more girls so that she'd be prepared for America's centennial celebration on July 4th of 1876. And nearby, along Morrison Street, was the house of Jenny Moore and her three girls, Fanny Moore, possibly related, Lydia Howard, and Kitty Boyce. While no proprietor, a.k.a. Madame, was listed, in multiple close addresses along Yamhill Street, there were several working girls residing. These girls may have been living in some of those tiny cribs, hence only a few girls, or only one at a given address. You'll note, a lot of these brothels, which are hardly everyone, 
but just the ones I found were located just north of the Tenderloin District. But as the 80s went on, the Tenderloin became the more focal point of these houses. In the latter 1880s, we had at least four houses in a row on the west side of 3rd between Taylor and Yamhill. Emily Liddy had a home at the corner of 3rd and Taylor, and next to her were two matching frame houses. One was the house of Fanny James, and the other was the house of Blanche Hampton. If you're a regular viewer on my channel, the brothels of James and Hampton would ultimately be combined together years later to make the new Ross Hotel, which burnt down in 1917, possibly the result of arson by the hotel's manager, a story I covered in another video. Directly behind these two houses was the back way into the brothel of Nellie Grant, located the next street down on 4th. And then on the other side of Blanche Hampton's place was the former site of Carrie Bradley's Bonio, near the southwest corner of 3rd and Yamhill. Her four girls were Faye Williams, Molly Thompson, Molly Moss, and Belle Boyd, who also went under the name of Dolly Adams. While other brothels in the area kept it classy and discreet, charming madams and gorgeous forthcoming girls, Carrie was the outcast on the block. Originally from Michigan, she came to Portland in 1877, and by 1880, at the age of 27, she had her own house. In addition to these girls, Carrie also kept two Chinese servants there that she used for extra muscle, along with two other men, her lover, Charlie Hamilton, a bar brawler, and a recent ex-con, Pete Sullivan. Carrie's girls were known to live in fear of her. While other brothels certainly engaged in occasional vice outside of prostitution, Carrie Bradley's place took it to another level. Most men who visited her place should have expected to be drugged and robbed. She'd even use chloroform and opium to incapacitate her male visitors. They'd then often be transported, passed out, to a random part of town, leaving them there to wake up bewildered. There were few crimes that Carrie and her crew wouldn't stoop to. The prostitution side of it was almost an afterthought. And while this was going on, a push for what was called moral reform was on the go, with new ordinances put into place to punish brothels more so than in the past. A lot of this was brought on by ongoing pressure from local churches, of which there were many in the vicinity of the Tenderloin District. In many ways, churches were fighting prostitution more than the police were. And these churches were flat-out hilarious sometimes in terms of their naivete. They argued that men wandering anywhere near a brothel should be immediately arrested for vagrancy. One thing that churches harped on over and over and over again over the years was their concern for the normalization of sex work and its attraction of young men. These poor men, in addition to not being properly raised by their parents, were also the sad victims of these lingering harlots. While there were some periodic arguments to the contrary, most of the time, in particular with these church people, Women were the perpetrators, and men were the victims. Clearly, these men had no control over their actions, or whatever. In one 1875 article, a member of the YMCA argued that if you gave a young man a handshake and a nice dinner at your, quote, sweet, pure home, unquote, it would turn these wayward fellows off of brothels altogether. Just... So damn stupid. And while these large church gatherings sought to focus on the lost, poor, and downtrodden, they were done in large churches or lavish ballrooms, often serving expensive dinners like caviar on toast. Something tells me that money could have been better spent on other things of significance. But hey, this is how things worked. Lots of talking, 
harping on the same points, followed by just more talking. Just enough talking to get enough people reactive, forcing law enforcement to at least sort of take action. And when it came to young girls, potential future sex workers, church organizations often tried to swoop in and, quote, save them. This was particularly the case with Chinese people, whom the churches were already trying to force Christianity on. There were multiple instances of church organizations flat out lying about the status of young Chinese girls so that they could gain custody of them. And these new ordinances just happened to go into effect while who else but James LaPayas was the chief of police. So once again, new rules seldom enforced. However, while the police continued to drag their feet, the district attorney's office wanted to actively combat this sexual vice. And Carrie Bradley was their primary target. And in late October 1881, they had their potential ace in the hole. A few days earlier, a man named James Nelson Brown, recently retired from a life of logging, came to Portland with $4,000 on him. He proceeded to go on a multi-day drunken gambling bender wherein he visited several brothels, Carrie's place included. On the night he was there, he went to a room with Dolly Adams. Then, the next day, he woke up broke and abruptly had Adams arrested for robbing him. His anger and desire for justice made him the perfect witness to help the DA's office run Carrie Bradley out of town. All Brown had to do was hang out and wait to be called to testify. Instead, he continued on his bender, and then he just disappeared. Weeks later, on November 25th, the bound up and beaten body of a man was found in shallow water of the Willamette River at the foot of Everett Street. A rope around his neck had been tied to a 100 pound stone in an unsuccessful effort to sink the body. Nobody had any idea who the man was, but he did have some distinct scars around his eyebrows. It was soon found these matched with scars on James Nelson Brown, who'd gone missing, and he'd soon be identified as this murder victim. His death was brutal. As Brown wandered the city in an endless drunken stupor, Carrie wanted him back at her place, no matter the cost. Finally, on October 28th, Pete Sullivan found him, and tried to convince him to come back. While saying he'd never go back there, Brown was surprised to see Carrie and Dolly Adams show up. For all his rage, Carrie had a way to win people over. Brown gave in and went back to her place, where she plied him with morphine-laced drinks. When he finally passed out, he was dragged upstairs where Carrie wrapped a chloroform-soaked towel around his mouth and nose. He suffocated in his sleep. To show the kind of madame Carrie Bradley was, after going upstairs the next morning and seeing his stiff corpse, she put on some brass knuckles and beat Brown's dead body in a rage. If you can believe it, after all of this, one thing Carrie's crew was not adept at was getting rid of a body. She first ordered Pete Sullivan to dig a hole in the basement to bury it. He dug for hours into the cold, hard earth, barely making an impact. Frantically, they summoned a trunk and a horse and buggy. After stuffing Brown's body in the trunk, the boys chaotically removed it from the area. They then lumbered it down to the river, dropping it multiple times before finally getting rid of the body. Almost. Carrie had been close to Police Chief LaPayas and offered to pay him $500 after the body was found, and capture for the murder was inevitable. Whatever happened in that case, Carrie and most of her crew were caught. She tried to throw Dolly Adams under the bus for the whole thing, which 
no one believed and led Adams to becoming a cooperating witness for the prosecution. While Charlie Hamilton fled the city, Pete Sullivan was caught and sentenced to four years in prison. Carey was given a 12-year sentence on a manslaughter conviction. Lucky, since this was clearly a case of murder. She would be released after five years. And as far as Charlie? Well, last info I found on him was that he'd fled to Mexico, killed a soldier there, and was likely to go before a firing squad before too long. Carrie Bradley would resume her work as a madame in California for a few years before taking her own life. James LaPayas would come under serious heat for his involvement in this case, which, along with revivals of the Danford Balch bribe story, led to his permanent removal as chief of police in 1883. While the infamous murder of James Nelson Brown had certainly added an element of darkness to the Tenderloin, Carey's hierarchy was effectively run out of town, and nobody else was running their places as flagrantly as she had. So, if anything, really little had changed. While the Tenderloin went on strong and its courtesans made good money courting a more upper-class clientele, it cannot be ignored, the struggles many of these working girls faced. They were used until they were all used up. They faced judgment on the streets on a daily basis, and unfortunately, some of them faced horrible ends. In October 1895, Ida Thornton, who'd worked herself senseless to support herself and her man, suddenly passed away from a hemorrhage in her lung. She was only 23. In a perfect metaphor for how her kind were treated, instead of having her own plot, Ida and another woman who died days earlier, Delva Riggins, were crammed into the same plot as a Henrietta Dorner who died months earlier at Portland's Lone Fir Cemetery. Because of this, I get the feeling that Delva Riggins was also a sex worker. A section to the southwest end of this cemetery was used specifically for Chinese immigrants. However, unlike an organized section of graves, this area was more of a mass grave wherein at least a few Chinese prostitutes must have been buried at one time. And then there was Anna Wright, who worked under the name of Frankie Moore as one of the girls at Minnie Reynolds' brothel on Fifth and Stark. On September 1st, 1887, a mystery man entered and went to a room with her. After the man left, Anna was discovered in a disassociated state. Thinking the man looked like a druggie, or a morphine addict as they put it, it was quickly determined he had administered a dangerous dose of the drug into Anna's body. A doctor was quickly called to the scene, and when he asked if she'd taken this lethal dose herself, she replied yes. But even the doctor said she was in such an incoherent state that everything she said should have been taken with a grain of salt. Despite the doctor's efforts, Anna died a few hours later. The man who visited her was never identified, in part because Minnie's girls kept their mouths shut. The last thing they were interested in was openly admitting what they were doing to the police. Whether the man forced the drug into Anna, or she chose to take it herself, they're both horrific ways to end one's life. And that was the flip side to the charming cribs, the alluring houses, and the willing women. But these tragedies all paled in comparison to the one that changed everything, the event that would begin the end of the Tenderloin District as it was known and spark the years-long effort to continue pushing houses of prostitution 
further and further north. Her name was Emma Merlotten, French Emma to her customers. She was a kind beauty, a literal hooker with a heart of gold. She also lived quite well off of the well-to-do men that paid to be with her. She had one of the nicest little cribs you could find along 3rd Avenue. Everyone in this business knew Emma. Originally born Anna Lacaz, she married a man named Merlotten, who abandoned her, and she found her way to Portland, and from there was finding her way in life. Until one night. During the 10 p.m. hour, on December 22, 1885, Emma's neighbor heard sounds of a struggle and went to investigate only to find a locked front door. The neighbor left but came back a few minutes later and found Emma's door suddenly wide open. Upon entering, Emma was found laying on the floor, her head caved in by an axe-like weapon. While hardly the first murder in the history of Portland, Emma Merlotten's brutal, savage killing was unlike any other, and got headlines as such. Suspects came and went, including a man going door to door, angrily asking people for money who was seen going to Emma's door not long before her death. A man had reportedly been arrested on a boat that night, covered in blood. A man named William Sundstrom came under suspicion when, seen loitering near Emma's crib a while after her murder, he was seen with scratches on his face, seemingly from a struggle. While a strong suspect for a moment, he was never charged in the killing. Even in 1896, a reportedly dying man tried to take credit for this crime. With no luck finding the killer, the authorities took to drastic actions which included the removal of Emma's eyeball as it was thought back then that when someone died, the last thing they saw would be forever captured like a snapshot on that eyeball and by removing Emma's eye, they could analyze it for the reflection of her killer. Obviously, this went nowhere. While she may have been the victim of a botched robbery or just a sadistic killer, a long-standing theory is that, considering her clientele, somebody with some power and influence who partook in her services had her killed off to keep their liaisons a secret. You've got to remember, adultery was the kiss of death for one's reputation at this time. And... Some husbands got away with murder by killing their wife's lover. If a man of influence in Portland was married and seeing French Emma on the side, if that came out, it could ruin that individual. And the dead tell no tales. Today, the murder of Emma Merlotten remains one of Portland's most enduring murder mysteries. But it added to a darker element in that area. Those trying to run brothels out of the Tenderloin used Emma's murder to show how bad the Tenderloin district had become. Men loitering around, waiting to hack defenseless women to death. It was unheard of back then. In fact, just a couple weeks before Emma's murder, Ordinance 4710 would be approved, which included a section that made it illegal to open any brothels in the city of Portland, leaving me to wonder if that applied to already established brothels at that time. Probably. Anyone busted for running such a place would be punished by a fine of at least $25 or a jail sentence of no less than 20 days. But most of the time, the city was content to take the fine. One section even threatened to penalize women from brothels for even lingering in the vicinity of their doorway or windows. The latter half of the 1880s, heading into the 1890s, would see the migration north really take shape. 
By 1890, these many women with their houses along 3rd and 4th Avenues were suddenly gone. And by the early 1890s, stretches along 5th and 6th between Morrison and Ankeny became the hot spot for brothel business. This hardly marked a decline in sex workers. It just pushed them closer to what was affectionately known as the Whitechapel area, and a short while later, the notorious North End. But this transition had hardly begun shape by the evening of June 12, 1888, when Reverend Ezra Haskell took the stage for a presentation at the city's Mechanics Pavilion. Despite being a high-up member of the church community, Haskell wasn't there to pander to his friends, nor was he there to spew out the same old pandering rhetoric, for the most part. He was ready to shake things up. In this expose, he called out the city for allowing all forms of vice to happen out in the open for all to see. And the ease of allowing crime had only helped it to spread. But in examining the laws and statutes of both Portland and the state of Oregon, he found them to be sound, leaving him to wonder why things had gone the way they did. To answer this question, while his fellow preachers lingered in their pulpits criticizing something they hardly understood, he went to where the vice happened to see things for himself and call out some of the things that nobody else was willing to. How shall we declare their sins unless we know them, he declared. In these efforts, he discovered for himself why things hadn't changed. As long as there was vice, the police officers in town had guaranteed work. If they ran out the prostitutes, gamblers, and petty criminals, they'd have less to do, likely leading to many of them losing their jobs. Not only had the police proven to be worthless, but many of the officers were directly involved in vice itself. They'd taken bribes in exchange for warning places that they were going to be raided. And even the city's police chief at the time, Samuel Parrish, was known to engage in gambling. To this, Reverend Haskell expressed, We cannot expect lawbreakers to enforce laws. Satan does not cast out Satan. As he proceeded to discuss his personal experience looking into vice from crooked saloons to dirty theater shows to gambling, he ultimately came to prostitution and the many brothels about town. To him, these were the worst vice of all, describing them as hells of pollution, living tombs of wrecked lives, lost virtue, and blasted hopes. By his count, Haskell said he'd found 66 brothels in the city, which contained some 250 women between them. He described one house along Broadway, led by a Miss Emma Weingard. It was a beautiful place, but Miss Weingard was a, quote, stench in the nostrils of decent men and women. But things got substantially worse, such as a crammed joint at Fifth and Pine, with reportedly 30 women there of varying nationalities. Reverend Haskell had such disdain for this particular brothel that he said, if properly investigated, murder victims would likely be found within its walls. Such places were known as charnel houses back then. And even in discussing what was left of the brothels in the Tenderloin District, Haskell called these places houses of death. He made mention of a few more houses of prostitution, one of which being on 6th between Stark and Washington, full of vice, but known to be visited by, quote, men high in station. Considering this place's proximity to the houses of Lita Fanshaw, Ida Arlington, and Minnie Reynolds, this should not be surprising. In fact, Haskell then referenced the stretch that these women were on, 
claiming many of their girls were teenagers. But there's no way to verify this, even though it's probably somewhat true. This was followed by references to an institution of deepest depravity, which was located at Second and Salmon. This house reportedly rented rooms for a dollar, with no questions asked. This presentation was rapturously received, even as Haskell was extremely critical of the city's police force, even to the point of calling them conspirators to crime, which was not inaccurate. But then, a couple days later, Reverend Haskell had a chance encounter with District Attorney Henry McGinn at the corner of 3rd and Washington. McGinn was understandably frustrated about the Reverend's remarks, and to express his anger, he beat Haskell right there in the street. The District Attorney found himself being charged with assault and battery. The District Attorney! Police engaging in crime while not fighting it, DAs beating the hell out of preachers, things were kinda coming off the rails at this time. And as the 1880s transitioned into the 1890s, tragedy continued to follow. In 1889, a madame by the name of Agnes Woodward and one of her former girls, Etta Crawl, would come under suspicion for the December 1887 murder of a man named Frank Cunningham. In an almost flawless recreation of James Nelson Brown years earlier, Cunningham came to town, loaded with cash, and went on a bender. After arriving in the city on December 21st, he would be found barely alive at the foot of Taylor Street on December 25th. Christmas! His money and jewelry had been taken. Ultimately, a grand jury would dismiss Woodward and Crawl and a few others, presumably accomplices. But it was another story that didn't help the reputation of these brothels. On June 21st, 1891, a young sex worker at the home of French Flora named Mary Price ingested carbolic acid and killed herself. It's believed she did this because of a man who used to visit her there and had stopped coming. It might have been love. Certainly some of these girls, engaging in the world's oldest profession, were left wondering when the right man would come along and take them away from it all. And certainly, sometimes the madames who ran these houses were the ones to suffer tragic ends. Prominent in her day, running a house in Portland, Bridget Gallagher would relocate to San Francisco in 1887 and find herself frequently in legal trouble. In a bout of mania, after an article was published about her by the San Francisco Chronicle, she stormed their office with a revolver looking for the writer of the piece and fortunately was disarmed quickly. She was institutionalized after this, with a lengthy estate battle going on between her and her presumed children before she just faded into obscurity. As the Tenderloin District slowly died, many brothels in the city were located between 5th and 7th, or what is now Broadway, going east and west, and between Morrison and Ankeny to the north and south. Many of these houses were addressed in a transcribed 1939 version of an 1894 publication outlining the charming resorts and amusements to be found in the city. Some of the madames mentioned in this piece are shrouded in mystery. Then there were others, like the aforementioned Minnie Reynolds, whose place was at Fifth and Stark. Directly across the street from her, were the posh brothels of Mabel Montague and Ida Arlington. While the Reynolds place was a simple frame house, the Montague and Arlington places were inside beautiful Italianate-style homes, almost as though transplanted there directly from New Orleans' Garden District. Such made sense as, if one was going to take inspiration from another city's brothels, New Orleans would be their best bet. 
to no surprise, the Montague and Arlington homes were described as gorgeous, well-furnished mansions lined with beautiful and charming young girls. While the landscape was changing, this era was probably the most flashy and flamboyant of Portland's era of brothels, an era destined to fade away. In addition to these three, this 1894 guide also referenced two of the city's most well-known brothel heads of that time, Miss Della Burris and Lita Fanshawe. These women's brothels were on the same block, with the back of one's house facing the other. Between Alder and Morrison Streets, Della's house was on Park Avenue, while Lita, whose real name was Louise, had her place on Broadway. These houses, no doubt, were the pinnacle of giving in to temptation, in luxury. Miss Fanshawe's place towered four stories high. Pretty impressive for the 19th century. She was able to class her way into such a joint just around the corner from the Portland Hotel and the Markham Grand Theater, places that definitely attracted classy clientele. She'd previously been a few blocks away between Washington and Stark, but her residence, along with the brothel of Miss Carrie Bainbridge, were destroyed by a fire on July 11, 1892. And by 1900, she would move to another, much smaller place next door at Broadway and Morrison, perhaps an indication of dying brothel business in that area. Or perhaps a smaller place just suited her better. Other brothel runners listed included a Madame Flora, who may have been the French Flora I mentioned earlier. Her place was at the northeast corner of 5th and Morrison, diagonal across that intersection from the Pioneer Courthouse. And then there was Miss Maud Morrison, whose house was located at the northwest corner of 6th and Stark, where the U.S. National Bank building stands today. But as elegant as some of these places had become, they were not long for this world. Hence may be why such iconic names as Minnie Reynolds, Della Burris, and Lita Fanshawe all but faded away by the dawn of the 20th century. Some may have just given up the racket or moved into some other realm of vice. Others probably just relocated elsewhere where they could more easily run such houses. And while occasional raids on such houses did occur periodically in the early 1890s, such as this particular one from July 1893, wherein the proprietors of four brothels were arrested, 1895 was the year that the wheels really began falling off. In what newspapers called the Moral Wave, several brothels were raided all at once, leading to the arrests of dozens of women. Those girls that weren't caught fled and took refuge in private residences, leading some to worry this would actually lead to a greater spread of prostitution, as though these girls were fleeing only to find new places to provide their services. These raids were different than the others. They led to many brothels actually shutting down, and if one wanted to keep their business going, they had to migrate north. It's thought that the Panic of 1893 helped in all this, as when things get rough, historically, there would be a greater push by a city and its people to combat vice. The counterbalance to this is that by the dawn of 1900, this vice was allowed to grow again. It's what usually happens. When things get better, people tend to get complacent, and vice rises up out of the woodwork again. And when things get bad, people get super reactive. Y'all remember the 2018 midterms? By the time of this serious blowback against houses of prostitution, it had already been acknowledged for years that no matter how hard the restrictions were or how harsh the punishments, prostitution was not something that was ever going to go away. The compromise then was to push it to the area known as Whitechapel. Not so affectionately named after a district in London of the same name, known for poverty and prostitution, as well as being the area where Jack the Ripper claimed his victims, 
Whitechapel would also be known as the Notorious North End. It would eventually become the city's Skid Row, as well as the city's present-day Chinatown. Granted, the general area is also known as Portland's Japantown. In the late 1800s, not only did this area, which I will simply refer to as the North End from here on, become Portland's main hub of vice, but it was also the area that people of color were pushed into. Beyond those of Asian ancestry, black people were also restricted to this area. It was convenient for the city's white population that all the things and people they didn't want to deal with could all just be pushed away. That was the desired objective with these 1895 raids. As is the norm, those associated with brothels who had enough money were able to get away while the working girls on the opposite end were left wondering what to do. Some probably found assistance through the church, granted in exchange for giving up their past profession and agreeing to find God. Granted, one local minister suggested the easiest solution for those displaced women was to just throw them all in the river. You know, totally logical, man-of-God conclusion to reach. Even by this time, after decades of brothels existing in Portland, the women were being held primarily responsible while the men who visited them were the poor victims giving in to sin and temptation. It was also a city with an all-male city government, all-male police force, and all-male preachers out here calling women sirens and whores and their customers innocent victims. They didn't care to understand why and how these women came to work at these brothels on a person-by-person -person basis. And furthermore, they didn't care to examine why all these men continued going to such places. After all, such an examination might force the men about town to acknowledge that a lot of these men going to see prostitutes were actually worse than the working girls. Portland was a dirty town, full of drunks, transients, and petty criminals, mostly men. Those who were married often drank and abused their wives, and sometimes their children. I can't tell you the number of stories I have found from this era showing the deplorable things that Portland men were capable of at this time. But yeah, these brothel girls were the worst of the worst. At least one editorial piece from an April 11th, 1895 newspaper, right after these raids had gone down, made the argument for equal responsibility. It takes two to trade, it said, as it noted that if men stopped visiting brothels, their business would die and such establishments would fade away. The actions of the men were the very reason that brothels not only existed, but flourished in the City of Roses. And, of course, as they were running these women north, the police department was still benefiting from them. Even on into 1897, it was unveiled that several officers, including the police commissioner, were mixed up in houses of prostitution, taking a percentage to keep quiet. Other establishments that refused to play this game found themselves being raided frequently. As the city's brothels almost exclusively relocated to the North End, north of Burnside Street, their charm mostly faded away. The charming homes of a Burris or a Fanshawe were now compacted within a couple blocks, in particular along 4th Street. And remember, not only were the remainders of these white-run brothels forced into the North End, but this was also where the Chinese-run brothels had been relocated. And there were also Japanese and Black-run brothels. But their histories are extremely obscure. It is known that most Black-run brothels were in the vicinity of 4th and Everett, while most Japanese-run brothels were in the vicinity of 2nd and Cooch. And despite forcing most all prostitution into such a tiny area, the first decade of the 1900s saw an explosion in sex workers, from hundreds to thousands. 
charming houses became cramped storefronts, rundown hotels and flop houses. And with it being the North End, despite the blossoming of Chinese and Japanese culture in the area, the worst kind of criminal scum were also wandering its streets. While in the past it was common practice in some brothels to rob the customers blind, with brothels now in the North End, these working girls would find those tables being turned. For example, on the night of November 7th, 1895, a butcher named Thomas Cronin went to the room of Jenny Morgan at her rundown 2nd Avenue brothel. After convincing her to go out and get them some beer, Cronin began ransacking the room. When she returned, sooner than expected, he found a handgun in her drawer and pulled it on her. When he opened fire, Jenny, in one of the most badass things I've ever heard, literally punched the gun, keeping the bullet from striking her. It went through a wall and struck a mattress that another girl in the house was laying on, missing her by an inch. Despite this, after fleeing the scene, Cronin was later tracked down drunk as hell at a nearby saloon, bragging about what he'd done. You know, when you try to rob and kill a prostitute and she punches the gun out of your hand. This was the new world for brothels in the city. Girls had to keep guns in their drawers. And sometimes that wasn't enough. On the night of September 24th, 1894, Jenny Gredden, who worked a place on 4th and Everett, met a man named E. DeMaine at a saloon. When she returned to her place, DeMaine, unprovoked, followed her, and upon entering her place, for whatever reason, pulled a handgun and swiftly shot her dead. And perhaps one of the most disturbing deaths to the east side of the North End happened at a seedy rooming house, likely a brothel, at the southeast corner of Second and Cooch on August 20th, 1902. It's not so much how the death occurred, but rather the upfront and center racism used to minimize the life and significance of the victim, in this case a woman named Annie Smith. While none of the articles regarding her death state she was a brothel girl, the Sanborn map from two years earlier showed that the area surrounding where she lived was filled with brothels, and she was also described as a quote, white slave, and it was said her husband, George Smith, survived off of her quote, shame. When George showed up to her room around 1 a.m. August 20th, Having recently separated from her, Annie was in her room with another man. Another possible indication that the place was a brothel, and the only other witness in the building at this time was another woman in her own room. Upon his arrival, George fired one shot into Annie's chest and fled the scene. At trial, he would claim he thought a man his wife had been seeing regularly was in the room, and he intended to shoot him. A witness said he saw an unhinged George Smith at a saloon earlier that night, brandishing his gun, talking about how he was going to kill a man that night. So maybe he was telling the truth? But what made Annie's death so tragic? Well, it was 1902, Annie was a white woman, and George Smith was a black man. And despite marriage between people of two different races not becoming legal in Oregon for nearly 50 more years, these two were married. George was ceaselessly mocked and insulted by those he knew for attracting a beautiful white woman. It was theorized this constant harassment, mostly from white guys, made him snap, especially after his wife separated from him, and he went to take out whoever was with her. But in Annie's case, the ongoing narrative was that she was a beautiful woman with potential who let it slip away and collapsed into depravity once she decided to marry a black man. Even in a death as 
brutal as murder. Newspaper reporters' favorite word to describe Annie Smith was pathetic. Maybe these reporters needed to take a look in the mirror. Despite the rough and tumble environment of the North End, most Chinese brothels there, as was in the case in the past, were run by Chinese tongs, who'd often pay off the police to keep them abreast of possible raids. And while there's a great number of reminders of Portland's Chinese history in present-day Chinatown, the early history of most buildings around there are obscure or just unknown. It's unknown if any of them held brothels, but there are a few places from the previous Chinatown that still stand and may have had a working brothel in them at some time. While this can't be proven, it's entirely possible and remarkable considering all the places that had white-run brothels are long gone. In particular, the Leon Chung Company building at 3rd and Taylor was built back in the mid-1880s and originally had a Chinese-run business on the ground floor. The second and third stories were described as living quarters, which absolutely could have held a brothel. Then there's Waldo Block on 2nd and Washington, built in 1886. In its earlier years, it was the headquarters to one of Portland's Chinese tongs and had a gambling den in the basement. Under those circumstances, it's entirely possible that a brothel worked out of there at some time. And despite having a very high Chinese population in the North End by the 1890s, Chinese sex workers were hardly immune from danger. Around 9.30 p.m. on the night of November 10th, 1893, a very popular local prostitute named Gong Fa, 23, was found discarded in a gutter under a street light near Second and Pine. Her throat had been slashed and the large murder weapon left under her body. Despite being in a heavily traveled area, no witnesses to her murder came forward. And due to her race, the police did little in terms of investigating her murder, dismissing it as a, quote, Chinese crime, unquote. And while brothels in their previous style did still exist to an extent, once relegated to the North End, one thing that began to change was the sex of the individual in charge. Brothels run by madames in the past, over time slowly started to be run by male saloon owners. And by definition, these places could be described as houses of prostitution. The way it worked out was simple. Most saloons on the North End had a hotel upstairs. Girls that were hired as waitresses for these saloons often had another job, doubling as sex workers who took the usually drunk customers upstairs to the hotel quarters above. These women were called box rustlers. At the very least, the saloon operators made some extra money running a hidden prostitution racket. And beyond that, if these drunks ever passed out, the girls could rob them blind. These operations were so common that even August Erickson, who ran Erickson's saloon along 2nd and Burnside, described at the time as the most lavish saloon in the world, had a prostitution operation going on upstairs. When this place burnt down in 1912, one relief was that the Dewey House connected to it had been closed down due to a multitude of things going on there, probably prostitution included, meaning no customers were there during the fire. And after the original Ericsson's burned, the replacement Ericsson's on 2nd between Burnside and Cooch also had a flop house type hotel built above it. This hotel, called the Pomona, most likely had a prostitution operation of its own. This is the same Pomona Hotel that I covered in another video that caught fire in the summer of 1975, killing 12, making it the most deadly fire in Portland's history. And of course, despite the relocation, 
law enforcement was still totally in league with vice operations on the North End. They still took money, and houses were able to easily keep operating even after raids and outcry from various citizens. The desperation got so great at one point that, in an editorial from 1902, wherein the same old claim that if brothels were just pushed to areas outside of Portland, that it would deal with the problem, someone literally suggested the idea of having spots outside of town place bids to claim these houses of prostitution, like literally bid on them. To the highest bidder, making the greatest sacrifice, you get a bunch of brothels. I mean, I guess it could help the smaller local economy in those outlying areas, but that's about it. One of my favorite visual representations of how many people felt about the city's police back in these days is this artist rendering showing an officer who appears to be blind and thus there is vice going on all around him out in the open. Like like these guys having a Donnybrook back here, like right behind him. Oh, and what do we have here? But possibly the funniest instance of police collusion with brothels, particularly on the North End, happened on May 14, 1904. Future Portland mayor, and at this time council person, H. Russell Albee, requested accompaniment from officers as he paid a visit to the heart of the North End brothel community to see firsthand how bad it really was. He would be accompanied by a Sergeant L.G. Carpenter and an officer resting, both of whom, unknown to Albee, had told all these local dives of his planned visit ahead of time. Bewildered by the officer's desires to enter establishments before him and the shocking lack of vice to be seen, Albie finally shouted Lieutenant Carpenter down as he ran up the stairs to what could have been the entry to just another rooming house. Flustered, Albie rushed up the stairs with him, where a presumed female landlord awaited them at the door. Past her, he could see several women in the hallways going into various rooms and locking their doors. The so-called landlord then quickly closed the door in their face. It was pretty clear what was going on in there, and it made it clear to Albie that he'd been made a fool of. Local brothel and saloon owners had a good laugh about the whole event in the days that followed, but the instance itself made it abundantly clear that the problems were still there, and that the police were not stopping it, and, in fact, benefiting in protecting it. In the end, Albie was quoted to say, It is a sad commentary upon local conditions when a man goes to the chief of police in good faith, asks for an escort, and then gets the treatment I received. The comment showed great naivete for what was going on, but he wasn't wrong. This insanity of doing little and expecting things to change was in full swing. Even in August 1903, when the city council forced a raid on a particularly notorious saloon slash brothel, Ultimately, everyone arrested was released, and the dive was allowed to reopen. Because the city government decided the circumstances related to the raid were illegal. In short, those running the city forced a raid to happen, and then undid their own work by calling what they did illegal. It was also during this time that the issue of grafting was brought to the city's attention, primarily by councilperson Fred T. Merrill, who will be mentioned again a little later. Merrill ran a bicycle shop and profited greatly from the bike craze of the 1890s. But by 1902, he was a member of the city council, making the statement that over the previous 20 years, gambling and prostitution houses had paid grafters amounts totaling in excess of half a million dollars. And remember, this is turn of the century. Now for those who don't know, grafting, simply defined, is the act of gaining money or advantage through the dishonest use of power or influence. Merrill also called out the fact that, through all the fines issued in previous years to such havens of vice, 
only a fraction of that money had made it into the city's treasury. So, where was that money going? Not to make any accusations. He hadn't even been in power for most of that time. But perhaps the city's mayor had some idea. Elected mayor in 1902 and presiding over the greatest explosion of prostitution in the city's history, George Henry Williams was ceaselessly criticized for his seeming incapability to combat vice as it continued to grow. When he claimed there was no real crime problem in Portland back in 1903, the Oregon Daily Journal responded to this by posting in their July 29th edition several crimes that had occurred over the past two months, almost all of which hadn't been solved. This included the attempted arson attack against an elementary school. But what does this have to do with the missing money? Well, after living in Portland during the 1850s, Williams became the United States Attorney General under President Ulysses S. Grant, but was forced to resign when his wife was accused of accepting a massive bribe to not investigate a New York-based mercantile house. Williams had also used government money to cover his private costs, justifying this by claiming that he always paid the money back. But still, not exactly the kind of guy one wants in control when the issue of missing local government money comes up. His criticism was so strong that in January 1905 he was indicted on a charge of malfeasance while in office for not enforcing statutes related to gambling houses. With the help of the DA at the time, John Manning, this charge was dismissed and Williams remained in his position as mayor for a few more months. And also, a slightly more light-hearted, if not direct, take on the city at this time came from a traveling man by the name of George W. Cunningham, recently arrived in Portland. Having stayed in cities all over the world, he made a bet to the mayor in an editorial that Portland was the wickedest city in the world. Amidst his criticisms, Cunningham noted the grand free exhibition of prostitution to be found and that he'd seen more houses of prostitution and wicked girls in Portland than cities four times its size. He offered to eat Mayor Williams's hat if he were wrong. And while, by this point, a long-standing concern in the community was that younger girls could get sucked into this world of sex work, those fears peaked in April 1904 when, during a small church meeting, claims were made against students at Portland High School that they'd been occupying rooms up in the North End, pursuing unsavory entertainment in the process. While an investigation into the matter turned up nothing, it did shed a light on concerns of a similar nature. Multiple people came out at this time expressing that their younger sisters or daughters were falling into lives of ill repute, and several parents also willingly admitted to letting their teenage daughters leave home and live in lodging houses around downtown. They also never asked questions as to how these young women at that time were able to make money to cover their life's expenses. And sometimes the husbands of very young women were the worst of the worst. In one piece from a March 13, 1903 newspaper, an H.B. Westfall successfully divorced her older husband when it was revealed he wanted her to take to a life of prostitution in order to support both of them. When she refused, he beat her, sending her running, screaming for her life from their home. Strangely, as it became more and more commonplace for the North End to be infiltrated by brothels and seldom shut down by the local government or its police force, some were just naive to this transition. An N.J. Bloggin, who had the beautiful Bloggin Block built on the edge of the North End in 1888, filed suit against an R.C. Smith in 1897, specifically for opening up a bunch of cribs in the vicinity of his building. 
Believing this adversely affected his property value, as well as the businesses in his building and attracting future tenants, were the reasons Bloggin filed this suit. It would be abruptly thrown out as Smith had only rented out the units he had, and those individuals that rented them chose to use them as brothels. Furthermore, it was noted to Bloggin that brothels had been in the area for a long time without him bringing about such complaints. As much as I love Bloggin Block, maybe don't build your building in the middle of Whitechapel. As time went on, control over these houses of prostitution were falling more and more under the power of men. The one exception to this was the Senate Saloon, which from roughly 1897 until 1909, was run by a woman who was born Elizabeth Young. But in the North End, she was known as Liverpool Liz. She'd came to Portland in 1890, and by the late 1890s, she was running a saloon on the northwest corner of 2nd and Davis, in the heart of the North End. In a time where women couldn't even go to saloons as customers, Liz was running her own place. And, like the rest, her reputation was based entirely on who you talked to. She was described as honest and respectable, but people were also known to, conveniently, find themselves losing their money when they visited her place. Like Nancy Boggs, Liz had her own legendary status, much of which is unverified. But what is indisputable is that she had a brothel in operation upstairs above her saloon. In another story that is perhaps not as notorious as it's been implied, Liz and a few others threw their hat into the bicycle craze of the late 1890s, and in 1899 obtained land in northeast Portland in the vicinity of where Peninsula Park is today. The objective was to build a big bicycling track with a saloon right in the middle. While the idea was ambitious, the locals hated it. The idea of a complex of that size and sort being right in the middle of their neighborhood. And while at least some of the complex, known as Evergreen Park, was realized, it was all gone within a year. According to Stuart Holbrook, a former promoter named Fred Merrill, previously mentioned, directly involved in the bike craze claimed that the main thing that killed that craze were hookers. Again, this is one man's take, but as the story goes, Liz had her girls dress provocatively and ride bikes around the track to entertain any men in the vicinity. And even after this, Prostitutes began regularly riding around on bikes and flashing smiles to the men they passed by. And thus, riding bikes quickly became a tainted thing. It was even said that when decent women rode their bicycles in town, they'd do it with a scowl on their face so as to be discernible from the smiling sex workers on their bikes. Prostitutes really did get blamed for everything. And the girls that worked for Liz were also no strangers to tragedy. In the spring of 1905, the girls working for her included May O'Brien, Blanche Thompson, and the recently arrived Nora Stone. Volatile and confrontational, Nora had worked as a sex worker off and on before becoming a resident above Liz's place after leaving her abusive boyfriend. On the night of March 25th, these girls went out to dinner, wherein a bitter fight began between Nora and Blanche. The fight was broken up, but after returning to Liz's place, Nora stormed Blanche's room and resumed the fight. As they scuffled, Blanche grabbed an oil lamp, which she then dropped, setting both of their clothes on fire. Blanche managed to put out her flames and fled the room. When a bartender went up, he found Nora engulfed in flames and threw a blanket on her to put the fire out. But it was too late. Despite living for another 19 days, Nora succumbed to her injuries. What's interesting about Blanche Tompkins, again a working girl, was that she had a rich husband 
10 years younger than her, named Walter Henry Tompkins. If one's wondering how that happened, well, according to newspapers, it seems he visited Liz's place and, probably drunk as hell, was coaxed by Blanche into marrying her. He woke up the next day and was suddenly a husband. Despite leaving town shortly after, practically fleeing, he did come back to help her legal defense. Around this time, another girl that worked for Liz was Madge Wilson, aka Nellie Doyle. She ended up leaving Liz's place to be a girl for a drugged out pimp named James Doyle. While roaming the North End, she met an army soldier named Henry Hose, who slit her throat in a fit of jealous rage at a third in Burnside Flophouse called the Winchester on October 19, 1906. His motive was reportedly jealousy regarding the other men she'd been with. Madge would be just another forgotten victim of murder in the city's north end because of what she was. Henry Hose had originally arrived in Portland after serving in the Philippines amidst the Lewis and Clark Exposition in 1905. Strangely enough, While the city likely did what it could to keep prostitution in check as this pseudo-world fair was taking place, the expo was held less than two miles from the North End. This time also represented the point of the highest number of working prostitutes in the city during the era that I'm covering. Certainly brothels were pushing back against efforts to keep them quiet as the expo brought more than a million and a half visitors. Lots of -of out-of-town men coming to Portland, literally looking for a good time. Something tells me the brothels of the North End were doing pretty good business during the summer of 1905. Just a side note before moving back to Liverpool, Liz. Liz's establishment faced harsher and harsher opposition as time passed, with the Senate Saloon being called the lowest dive in the city by some. Her liquor license would be taken away in 1905, and it appears around 1909 the Senate was all but gone. And for all of the connections she might have made in her heyday as a saloon-slash-brothel owner, one of Liz's closest connections were to Ernest de Comp and Caesar Marco, who had their own place just down the street from her. I say this because they were the witnesses for her will, which was executed under great suspicion after her death in 1913. And they probably had a brothel going on above their establishment as well, I mean, let's be honest. But Ernest de Comp, in particular, would later become the subject of citywide attention in 1920 when he became the most likely victim regarding a string of male body parts found scattered all over town. I covered this story in a video a few years ago. Long believed to be a member of the local French underground, Decomp had lots of debtors and some enemies, but in running his own saloon on the north end, something else he likely had going on again was brothel-like activities. In an October 1907 article, he was mentioned in a lawsuit with other men charged specifically with engaging with brothel girls. This was certainly another world from the Tenderloin District of years earlier. In fact, if one glances at the census again, only this time the 1900 census, we see the way things have changed since 1880. One key difference is that With the stigma of being a sex worker ever growing, girls who worked such an enterprise left the occupation section on the 1900 census blank, as opposed to most girls listing their job as prostitute previously. But if they left this section blank, then how did I know they were working out of brothels? Well, I had access to the 1901 Sanborn fire maps for the Portland area, documentation made only months after this census was taken. In looking at these maps, it is very easy to establish where houses of prostitution were in the North End as they were listed as female boarding, or FB, 
on the maps. This allowed me to find the exact addresses where these houses of women were and find those addresses on the census to see who lived there. In this census, I found a Lizzie Smith with a 60 4th Street address. This was Liverpool Liz's place at the time. It also listed six other women, quote, boarding there at this address, a clear sign of her brothel in operation. A stretch along 1st Street between Cooch and Everett, as well as a stretch along 4th between Davis and Everett, show numerous small lots all listed as female boarding. It's my guess that these were examples of those tiny storefront cribs that were known to infiltrate the North End during this time. I chose to conclude this history in 1910 for multiple reasons. By this point, the traditional concept of a brothel was barely in existence anymore in the area. While the 1900 Sanborn maps showed endless female boarding sites all over the North End, when these maps were done again in 1908, most of these types of lodgings had disappeared. The only place where they still existed by this time was centered at 4th and Everett, with them stretching the whole east side of 4th between Flanders and Davis. The very structures where these last lingering houses of prostitution existed were all but gone by the dawn of the 1920s. In the same year as these later Sanborn maps, Portland Mayor Harry Lane employed what was called an Angel Brigade to try and close down every remaining prostitution house on the North End and, like angels, help these women find Jesus 
and more ladylike employment. And that was just one of the many things Mayor Lane did to try and quash all manner of vice in the city. The same nonsense the city had been doing for decades. This was followed by a vagrancy law passed by the state of Oregon in 1911 that made prostitution flat out illegal. A law that would stand in place for 60 years. A 1913 abatement law put responsibility for places of prostitution on those who own the building, leading to property owners being a bit more critical about who they leased or rented their spaces to. And this made sense, as most property owners just claimed ignorance upon learning their properties were being used as brothels when some of them had to know. And by 1908, Mayor Lane, who'd taken over for the unpopular Mayor Williams, staked the claim that prostitution in the city had decreased by 50%. While most definitely hyperbolic, with the peak of prostitution growth being around 1905, one could not deny that at least a change was happening. The concept of a brothel, by definition, faded. Certainly there were still houses of various types that were run by a woman wherein it was most likely known that some female residents were engaging in sex work. But in most cases these women were landlords or managers and not strictly madams. And sites where prostitution was engaged in spread to various spots all over town as opposed to being strictly concentrated in one area like before. That's what seemed to happen. It was a different era. Prostitutes, based on their standing, mostly spread out between the hotels and rooming houses of town. Some were financially successful, just not so much in the North End. When Alan Rushlight was Portland's mayor from 1911 to 1913, prostitution was a major thing that he had to deal with. But even in his regard, most prostitution that was uncovered was tied to hotels and rooming houses, not brothels so much. By the time the 1911 vagrancy law had been removed in 1971, prostitution hadn't changed all that much. Most sex workers were working out of rundown hotels in the rougher parts of town. Only by the 1970s and into the 80s, those rough areas included stretches like Union Avenue and 82nd Avenue. The Continental Motel on East Burnside was a notorious dive known for prostitution throughout the 80s. And a few murders. But that's another story. With technological advances today, selling sex has expanded to things such as online pornography and OnlyFans, to name a few. People doing this are also frequently disrespected and slut-shamed. The prevailing attitude is that it's all sin. Sex work now and sex work 150 years ago, it's all the same debauchery. It brought us no benefits and only served to present the very worst that humankind had to offer. Okay, j just calm down, Karen. We're gonna get through this. First off, the dividing line when it comes to works related to sex often comes down to the Christian side and the not-so-Christian side. Thus, it's subject to bias and opinion. So, were brothels objectively evil? No. No, they weren't. Did they have negatives? Certainly. Varying crimes, mostly getting men drunk and robbing them, were common. The spread of STDs was always possible. While madams took care of their girls, they also often took financial advantage of them. But they always covered their girls' bail and fines if they got arrested, so... Yeah, there were plenty of problems with brothels, but at the same time, they were simply establishments wherein the services were used by consenting adults. The men were desirous, and the women were willing. And let's understand a few other things about this era of prostitution in the city, some of which have 
been discussed to some degree thus far. First off, women's career options were limited, to say the least, during this time to a handful of jobs which did not pay well. If a woman wanted to survive and be able to support herself, sex work was the best and sometimes only option. The other classic choice was find a man and marry him and let him support you. Portland men in these early decades did not only consist of many, many, many abusive alcoholics, but it was a transient town, leaving lots of the male workers there barely able to support themselves, much less a wife and family. The number of brutally violent stories I found over the years involving husbands in Portland is gut-wrenching. Many wives during this time were lucky to lead a mediocre existence. While a brothel girl certainly could encounter violent male customers, she had fellow girls and house muscle there to help protect her. Women who found work in brothels not only got paid better than most other women in town and were given a place to live, but this work, somewhat ironic considering their clientele, allowed women to gain financial independence preventing them from needing to rely on a male partner to support them. Strangely enough, it was about as feminist a job as a woman could get in those days. This may explain why iconic woman suffragist Abigail Scott Dunaway described Nancy Boggs as a hard-working woman who did not deserve the censure cast upon her by the city's press. A long-standing criticism of sex workers is that their work doesn't make any great contributions to society. God forbid we not all be doctors or lawyers. Most jobs don't make a major contribution to society. They just don't. But people want their services, and thus they exist. Work is work, and the hell with anybody who says otherwise. Oh, and... As far as that not contributing argument, most towns coming into existence, in particular out west in the 1880s, not only had brothels, but relied on them. The girls who worked them put the money they made back into the local economy. In a larger town like Portland, I don't think we realize the significance of this alone. But beyond this, brothels functioned almost like a tourist destination. Lots of men passing through from out of town wanted to have a good time, drink at some local saloons, and pay for the services of some local women. So these brothels weren't only bringing in money for their services, but sometimes they were bringing in new money. So, actually, these brothels were significant contributors in relation to the local economy. They were so significant that they put who knows how much money into the city's pockets just by paying for bail and fines whenever a raid occurred. Whatever one thinks about madames, one thing's for certain. When they or their girls were arrested, they paid bail and fines quick. If the police arrested some brothel girls, you knew money was guaranteed to come in. It almost makes you wonder why, after raiding and charging these brothel girls for the very crime of being brothels, that these brothels were allowed to just go back to what they were doing. It's because it was financially beneficial to the city, and the police for that matter. Again, many brothels paid off the police to alert them when raids were going to happen, or to sometimes, prevent raids from happening altogether. So, while the city government, the police, and prominent local citizens chastised the very existence of prostitution in the city, they also selfishly allowed it because they benefited from it. But only the brothel girls were the bad guys, right? And that's another thing. The concept of sex work is, at its core, one consenting adult agreeing to pay another consenting adult for sexual favors. It takes two to tango. But again, the women workers were the criminals and the men who pursued their services were the manipulated victims. This is 
clearly absurd. The only reason brothels existed was because men in town wanted their services. They were explicit, obviously. And to think, lots of these male customers were married men in a time where an act of adultery could ruin your life. But still, they were victims. In fact, something I noticed in all the articles I found discussing brothel raids, we only see reports on the women who were working, getting arrested. Certainly during some of these raids, male customers were caught in the act. And while men would sometimes be arrested in relation to what they were doing, their arrests rarely ever made it to print. Of course, the last thing we'd want to do is get a loving husband or doting father arrested, right? In fact, the only time I found men getting arrested in relation to brothels, which was rare, was when they were busted trying to rob one of the girls there. So even when they did get arrested, and it was reported on, it was often not related to the sex work that was going on. At the end of the day, it was always the woman's fault. And can we say things have completely changed now? No, not even close. Slut shaming is still as American in our society as apple pie. Now, I, I know some people are going to turn this particular video on and then turn it off long before they ever get to this point because the content bothers them or whatever. Some people are going to be annoyed that someone would dedicate so much of their time to covering the history of such deviant behavior, but I don't give a shit. I really, you know, I, I don't... I wanted to come in and just tell it like it was. And it's a fascinating history, independent of anything. I, I, I don't understand and I hate that there's people out there that think because a history is particularly dark or because a history doesn't fit in with their particular moral compass about what's right and what's wrong, that somehow it's not history worth discussing. And I spend a great deal considering the time and place discussing the greatest adversary to brothels and prostitution as a whole being the church and its people. But certainly one thing you cannot forget in that equation at the same time is men. And one of the main reasons I didn't talk so much about men in this is because most of the men that were actually calling brothels out during this period that I'm covering were church people. And I discuss church people in it. I feel like for the most part back then, uh, if there were men calling out brothels or prostitution they were either associated with the church and or they were those guys that were using the services and didn't want anybody to know you know like when you do something you don't want anybody to know about it so you go maybe a little too far in terms of trying to show everybody how you hate it uh, but obviously over the years uh, male um, aversion to sex work has always been prevalent even though they are the very sex that allows that enterprise to thrive and all the way up till nowadays where you still have a whole bunch of men calling out sex workers except for the most part it's usually on the one end your um your overt alpha males who think they have the right to tell women how to live their lives and have this wild bizarre aversion to anything sexual of course unless they're forcing the women in their lives to have sex with them then that's normal and then on the polar opposite end you've got your incels that hate anything women do sexual because they're mostly virgins that can't get women and they are also men who think they're entitled to sex and they aren't getting it so of course if you're doing sex work that's that's not going to be okay with them so it's it's pretty much the worst of the worst that the male sex has to offer that are the most outspoken in terms of criticism against sex work and even most women that call out sex work nowadays they're usually just women of the christian conservative variety so no big shocker there you know when we talk a lot about history we talk about it through 
the famous people, not these various brothel girls, many of whom I couldn't find any information about when I was doing newspaper researches and things like that. They're these women that only show up in print one, two, three times, and that's all we know about them. Uh, mostly forgotten, just girls that came and did their job, and you know, they, even when people talk about you know brothels and brothel history in Portland, they're these very short pieces. They only touch on big points. They don't dive in the way that I did, and you know, that's that's part of that's why I like covering obscure stories and forgotten stories and histories like this is because these are the histories that not only don't get told that often but they're the histories that a lot of people historians included would assume you don't really talk about you know when it comes to portland they don't want you to talk about the bad stuff and yeah the whore houses and stuff they don't want you talking about that they just assume you forget about it and when someone really tries to convince you to forget about something history related that's a major red flag for me that tells me you've got an agenda here you're trying to whitewash history you're you're trying to dictate the terms of what you know what is accepted what we're allowed to learn about what we're allowed to remember and that's bullshit History is history. Everything is history. When I went to work yesterday, this period of my shift that I worked, that's history. So, yeah, just because history books usually don't talk about it, or maybe give it one sentence before moving on, doesn't, doesn't mean it's a history that shouldn't be learned. And for all of the stigma and vilifying that we do towards sex workers then and now the simple fact of the matter is these were girls doing a job these were women actually finding independence in their lives during a time where that was incredibly rare and it's wild to to look at the attitudes of that time and how a lot of people today would respond to the history that i've talked about here and think that somehow the madams and the girls working in the brothels were somehow like the worst of the worst, the, the biggest stains on humanity, the court of death, as they called the tenderloin. The fact that they really seriously acted like those were the worst people with all of the other sorts of crimes, violence, violence from men against women, murders, shanghaiing, you name it, all of that stuff going on. And people wanted to act like somehow the brothels were the worst of it all. (laughs) Give me a break.